Before we begin, I want to make sure everyone knows that my other channel, Somewhere Sinister, is back and we have a ton of episodes coming your way. We hit 80,000 subscribers recently and I'm hoping you guys can help us hit 100,000. If you enjoyed this channel, you'll probably like Somewhere Sinister. We tell interesting stories that either deal with crime or are crime adjacent and show a more sinister side to the world. Each season, we pick a different area and tell stories from there. The first season was the Pacific Northwest. We're currently on Season 2, the Deep South. And soon, we'll move on to Season 3, the American Southwest. After that, we plan to leave the U.S. and hit some more exotic locations. Check it out and hit subscribe if you like it. Let's get to 100,000 subs. Thanks so much. Now on to the monsters. In January 2021, the small suburb of Tullamarine, Australia was rocked by a brutal and tragic event that left an entire community reeling. The bodies of four family members, including three young children, were discovered inside their family home. They were all victims of a horrific murder-suicide. The mother and perpetrator of this heinous crime has captured the attention of people all around the world. How could a seemingly loving mother with no known history of violence carry out such a shocking act against her own family? The details of the case are haunting and disturbing as investigators tried to piece together what led to this tragic outcome, something that has become a cautionary tale of the dangers that can lurk beneath the surface of even the most seemingly idyllic lives. This is Monsters. <laughs> The Perinovich family seemed to be a picture-perfect suburban unit. Katie Perinovich, a loving mother of three, was known for her warm smile and her dedication to her family. Everyone who knew her, even after the tragedy happened, had come out to say nothing but beautiful things about her. Her husband, Tom, was a hard-working man with a knack for fixing anything that broke. Their children, 11-year-old Claire, 7-year-old Anna, and 3-year-old Matthew, completed the family portrait. To outsiders, their family was one that most people envied, but that was a picture of the family prior to 2020. When a lockdown was ordered in Victoria in March of that year, Katie was stuck at home without being able to visit friends and family. Her husband, Tomislav, who goes by Tom, said that the isolation had a severely negative effect on Katie's mental state. Neighbors would say that they saw Katie the day before the event and heard the kids outside playing in the days prior. Like many people with mental health issues, Katie was doing a good job of hiding her own despair. Katie had stopped working at her job as a physiotherapist in March of 2020, as was mandated to stay home and take care of the three children, which included homeschooling their oldest child, Claire. As expected, the new development was hard on the couple, but Tom said that it was more strenuous on Katie and it had a great deal of negative effect on her mental health. The stress was beginning to take a toll on her. Between the early days of March and the end of 2020, Victorians were locked down in their homes for a period of 262 days, one of the longest lockdowns in history. Tom also attested, quote, When restrictions were eased, Katie had started withdrawing from friends. She'd say we can't meet. She kept reading articles and listening to media news over and over. Tom also said that she began experiencing paranoia, being scared and worried over nothing. To avoid her always being indoors, they started a routine that involved exercises, taking walks in the evenings, and getting fresh air. As Katie continued living in isolation from her friends and family, her mental health rapidly declined. After the lockdown was eased, there was a 3-mile or 5-kilometer radius on how far people could travel, and that made distance become a barrier for her friends and family members who wanted to come and check up on her well-being. Therefore, she was not able to see her family. Days turned into weeks and months, and as time went by, her memory began becoming affected. At some point, she couldn't even remember the pin to unlock her phone. After several failed attempts, they had no other option but to send the phone away to be unlocked. After a while, she was able to pick herself up and go back to work, but after only a few weeks, she quit. 
Whatever made her resign her position still remains a mystery even to Tom, as he never got an explanation before she would eventually take herself and her children out of this world. Tom said that a few days after Katie quit her job, he got a phone call from her boss telling him that Katie needed medical attention and mental health help. The boss didn't disclose what had happened, saying, quote, I can't tell you what she's done, and that was it. According to Tom, her boss also mentioned that he wasn't taking care of his wife. Tom asked in what way, but her boss didn't elaborate. This vague phone call did nothing but add confusion to Tom's life, and he later said, quote, I didn't know what her boss was talking about. In the long run, Katie also became worried about her own mental health as it continued to deteriorate and she was left with no other option but to visit the local doctor. At this point, she was having a mixed feeling of paranoia, exhaustion, and anxiety. Before she saw the doctor, she had told Tom that she felt that someone was watching her through the CCTV camera within their home and she felt she was being monitored. The local doctor gave her a prescription for sleeping pills and asked her to go home, but that was not a result that satisfied Tom. He took her back to the doctor for further treatment and a better diagnosis. Katie was referred to the Royal Melbourne Hospital's Northwestern Mental Health Facility. However, this didn't help as her mental health continued to spiral out of control as the lockdown restrictions continued. According to Tom's later statement to the coroner, he said, quote, Ultimately, the COVID-19 restrictions meant that I wasn't able to come into appointments with Katie, and I'd have to wait in the car or not attend. I was unaware of what was happening in Katie's appointments or her treatment plan unless Katie told me what was happening. Then, on one of those days, Tom found a way to get into the appointment with Katie, but once they were with the doctor, she asked him to leave. When Tom objected, it led to Katie having a complete mental breakdown. On the upside, it was what led Katie to finally being prescribed medication. After that, Katie asked for some time apart from her husband, which he tried his best to give her. If she needed time to work on herself, he wanted her to have it. Within a short time, they were over with their separation, and again the family were back to living in the same house, under the same roof, and being a happy family. Or more than likely, they were pretending to be. At the end of 2020, Katie overdosed on her medication. Tom wanted her to get checked up at the hospital, but she refused. When she finally saw the doctor, she told him that she accidentally took too much, trying to induce sleep and never intentionally wanting to overdose. The doctor was angry and didn't buy Katie's excuse. Hence, he told Tom to hide the medications away from Katie and manage them himself. From that point on, it became his duty to administer Katie's medication. It turned out that Tom took the pills out to the garage and hid them there. Tom mentioned in a later interview that there wasn't anything explicit that showed that the children could possibly have been harmed by Katie. She wasn't toxic towards them. Her approach towards them hadn't seemed to change as her mental health declined. She was still the loving and caring mother that she had always been to them, so Tom had no reason to believe that leaving them alone with her would put them in any danger. On January 14, 2021, Tom had gone out to buy a new television for the family. He was only away from the home for a few hours, just enough time to purchase the TV and to stop by the grocery store. When Tom came back, he saw the lifeless body of his son lying on the couch in the living room with a cut and injuries on his head and arms. With no idea of what had befallen the remainder of the family, he put a call through to emergency services. As the paramedics attended to his lifeless son, Tom went to the other rooms in the house only to discover what Katie had done. He returned to the living room and let the paramedics know that they were all dead. When the Victoria police got to the crime scene, they instinctively believed that Tom was the culprit who had committed the murders of his family. Tom, who was distraught and in shock of what had happened in his home, was handcuffed by the police. At the scene, he was interrogated while the paramedics attended to him due to his shock. He was then taken to the police station. Tom would later tell the coroner, quote, when the police came, there were so many people, and I was in a state of shock and couldn't speak. I was just lost for words, and it was incomprehensible to me what I had just seen in my home. The police treated me unfairly. There were so many faces and detectives questioning me outside on the nature strip in front of everyone on the street. He also went further to say he recalled a policewoman yelling at him during that traumatic moment, which further broke him. 
When the detectives had seen that he was probably innocent, they bundled him in a blanket and dropped him off in front of his parents' house. He also told the coroner that he wasn't given any medical help both at the station and when he was dropped off at his parents' home. The next day, the police apologized to Tom. However, he asked for a written apology in hopes that they'd never treat someone else that way ever again. Despite it being years since the incident, Tom has yet to be granted custody of his wife's mobile phone, which contained photographs of the children and his family as a whole. He called the photos priceless. He said that Katie's phone was seized by the police for investigation and examination, and since then it has never been returned. The Victoria police have refused to comment if they truly did give an apology to Tom or as to why Katie's mobile phone is still in their custody. Tom's sister, Maria, had come out and said that she had a similar experience during her brother's arrest. She stated that the police wouldn't allow her to see Tom while he was in custody. She also said that they had given her the impression that he had committed the crime. On top of that, they didn't outright tell the media that he was innocent immediately. It was a day later and by then the media had already broadcast the first news story regarding Tom's arrest. That was pretty bad. Everyone thought that he was a guilty man who had murdered his wife and children. His image was all over the media as a murderer, and the worst part was that he was dropped off by the police without any medical help or counseling. There wasn't any support or social worker provided for him. Tom was in total shock and his mind was in utter chaos. After being left to fend for himself, a victim's advocacy group provided his family with the number of a counselor they should call. The group told the family that only three sessions would be covered and they'd take up payment for the rest of the service. Then came the stigma. According to Maria, quote, For men, there is always a stigma about he treated his family, which is unfair. Tom was a loving, supportive, kind, loyal, and hardworking father and husband. It has been extremely difficult for me to watch my brother go through all of this and see his sadness, which is ongoing, and it will be for the rest of his life. At the end of the investigation, a judge stated, quote, it is likely that the brevity of reviews from the 8th of December 2020 onward and the lack of face-to-face -face or telehealth reviews contributed to psychoeducation not being provided, and this may have also contributed to her non-compliance. The judge was unable to state if there was a probability that the deaths could have been prevented. She did say, quote, I do, however, find that the mental health treatment that was provided to Katie Paranovich to be suboptimal in the circumstances. I acknowledge and accept appropriate restorative and preventative measures have been taken by Northwestern Mental Health since the fatal incident. The judge made no findings on what impacts Victoria's lockdowns had in contributing to the sudden mental illness suffered by Katie, or those tasked with helping her. She said, quote, I find that there were missed opportunities to intervene in the course of events preceding and leading to Katie Paranovich's death. Despite her unforgivable act, Tom still seems to want to see the best in his wife. According to him, quote, Katie was a great mom and good physiotherapist. She helped and treated many patients over her career, and it's a shame that she was not provided with the level of care she deserved at her time of need. Despite Katie Perinovich being a great mother while she was alive, her final act, the one that ended the lives of her three children, is what turned her into a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. 
Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.